Hello, and thanks to Dr. Crawford for allowing me to participate in this forum. I am a partially retired medical oncologist from the University of Colorado Cancer Center. These are my disclosures. I consult for a number of companies developing prostate cancer therapies. Also, please note that I was assigned the negative side of this argument. In my personal practice, I have been using PSMA-based scans with increasing frequency in many situations based on superior sensitivity and specificity. If we look at the old standard technetium bone scans, as this slide shows, the sensitivity is suboptimal and highly variable, ranging from 4% to 60%, depending on PSA cutoffs. The Stanford Bioinformatics Group used an algorithm incorporating current guidelines, shown on the left, and the electronic medical record to see how often practitioners were following expert recommendations. For low-risk patients where no bone scans were recommended, 10% of the time they were ordered. Conversely, for high-risk patients where the bone scans are recommended, they were only obtained 73% of the time. This leads to my first conclusion. For Technetium 99M bone scintigraphy, there are abundant data in the U.S. and elsewhere for a criteria on when to order routine bone scans. The newer imaging tests have no such data. How often do these scans result in false positives? How often are there false negatives? And perhaps more important, what is the consistency among radiologists in reading the newer scans, and what sort of training do they need before we clinicians will feel comfortable in making therapy recommendations based on their reads? As shown in this study, the ability of CT scans to accurately predict lymph node involvement is certainly suboptimal, as we all know. The accuracy is only about 50-50, like tossing a coin. So we know that CT scans are poor predictors, but at least we have extensive data. The accuracy of second-generation scans is still being worked on, and very few studies exist comparing them to the gold standard of extended lymph node dissection which itself is operator dependent along with the questions on radiology readings. The three large trials published in the last two years on the use of second generation antiandrogens all used conventional imaging. These exciting studies all showed a substantial advantage in time to radiographic progression by adding one of these drugs to patients with rapid doubling times of less than 10 months. As an aside, these data show that using these agents is not without toxicity, particularly fatigue. This can be very challenging in older, frail individuals. However, the toxicity is not limited to fatigue and hypertension. To place these patients on expensive second-generation antiandrogens costs nearly half a million dollars during their lifetime. This slide shows the hypothetical advantage of using abiraterone in low dose with food. Although not approved, I consider this approach frequently. So aside from the toxicities of the studies using conventional imaging, we really don't know how the second generation imaging would affect any of these studies. Finding the occult metastases with newer techniques puts us into an unknown area. Using strict approval criteria, we don't know how or whether patients with second generation image detected metastatic disease might benefit. Another consideration is the cost of these newer agents. Shown here, they are considerable. In this paper, the authors attempted to justify these increased costs by looking at reduced, quotes, futile, end quotes, therapies. On the other hand, they did not consider the current potential increased costs of going after oligometastatic disease with expensive SBRT, and we have no idea whether there are savings with fewer standard scans being ordered once second-generation imaging is available. These new scans also play havoc with trying to retrospectively look at newer therapies like second-generation antiandrogens, abiraterone, or oligometastatic treatment. The Will Rogers phenomenon means that these scans will make all newer studies look better than the old ones on which drug approvals have been made. A change in clinical trial design in the era of next-generation imaging Inconsistent use of the technology among centers will make interpretation more difficult. Thus, pharma will have to pay for potentially both standard imaging and new imaging as these techniques are approved.
Further, we can gain a lot of information from just better use of the older techniques. Sodium fluoride PET scans have been around for more than a decade. This study shows that if one uses them to more carefully examine what is going on with metastases, there is great heterogeneity. Some lesions are still responding when PSAs are going up, shown here in green, while others are progressing or new, shown in red. Maybe treating these localized progressive lesions would offer as much benefit as changing systemic therapies. In summary, we have level 1 evidence on treatment of non-metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer using conventional scans, not with the second-generation scans. Introduction of second-generation scans will result in stage migration, making interpretation of the new trials difficult. The second-generation scans are far more expensive, especially if they don't replace current scans and treatment changes. We need to better utilize the current scan technologies. And the benefits of treating oligometastatic disease is early and uncertain with many unanswered questions, such as whether or not to also use ADT with such therapy and how many metastases constitute oligometastatic disease, etc. Thank you.